Good morning. Welcome to the Second Presbyterian Church of Charleston and its suburbs, as this church was known over 200 years ago when it was formed in 1809. And for over 200 years now, we have gathered here most of the time in this sanctuary to point to Jesus Christ. And we all know that it's different these days. Now, ordinarily on Mother's Day, we would be joining in the sanctuary in our seersucker suits and fancy hats, and then we'd be looking forward to having dinner in the park on the lawn afterwards. But things are different now. You'll notice I'm not wearing my seersucker. It's a little cool outside. Plus, I wanted to wait until we all can join together. Now, one other thing that we do on Mother's Day is our congregation will join with other Presbyterian churches in offering support for the Presbyterian communities of South Carolina. Now, the mission of these communities is simply this. We are a compassionate Christian ministry, they say, dedicated to enriching the quality of life for seniors of all faiths. And the offering that we give directly touches the lives of those needing financial assistance, assuring them that they can continue to call Presbyterian communities home. It's important. Now, our session and leaders of the church will be gathering this Tuesday to consider our steps as we go towards returning to corporate worship as well as online. Now, what do you think? Shall we worship in the park? Send your thoughts. We'll be prayerful and prudent as we consider this. And now, would you please join me in the call to worship that you'll see on your screen, Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for these times together, and we ask that you would be with us in our worship. Would you pour through me the words that you would have us here this day that will touch us at our point of need? And may the meditations of all of our hearts, plus these words that you pour through me, be acceptable in your sight. And so we dare to pray as you would have all who would be your disciples pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Give praise to Him. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess who we are, then God offers us a way back into right relationship. So let us confess together. Will you join me in the confessional prayer on the screen? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Now here's the good news. I proclaim to you the love of a Savior who would not love us less for anything that we might have done, but who through God's very nature could not love us more. So for every heart that is truly repentant, here's the good news. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Benevolent God, on this day of celebration, we gather as Christian community to share our faith, to sing your praises and to hear your word for us today. We do so, O oh God, in gratitude for the gifts that you have given us, the gift of life itself, the gift of love, of love sustained in relationship with family, with one another, and with you. Lord God, we yearn to live our life as you intend for us to live it, in obedience and in boldness. You continue to equip us with what we need to do the tasks to which you clearly call us. We trust and we recognize that you continue to bless us with the empowering of your Holy Spirit. Enable our ministry in your name, Lord Jesus. Direct our daily walk that we each may preach with our lips and with our very lives. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace that sets us free from the burden of sin and guilt, sorrow and fear, and from fear of death. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which alone enables us to fulfill our calling to be witnesses. And we thank you for the gift of our mothers and our grandmothers through blood and through grace. And for those who reside with you and who we know as an absent presence. Though gone from our lives, absent from our everyday reality, a mother's and a grandmother's presence and wisdom still here, guiding us and shaping us. Lord, as, as Christ followers, we know that we are loved by you, even and perhaps most especially in experiences of absence and loss. And so we pray that we recognize the opportunities you give us to testify and to make a faithful response. We pray that our living gives the same message of love and faith as our lips proclaim. And so this day we pray for Kathy's mother, Mary. Be with her in her sickness. We pray for Jason and his colleagues in Stanford, for Cynthia, for Carrie, for Lucas, for Drew, for AJ, for Kristen, for Brittany, and for all on the front lines in care. We pray for Chris and for Cliff and for all who protect us, Lord, and who often bear the brunt of impatience and frustration. We pray that you would be with our businesses and our restaurants and our grocery store employees and our churches as we pray to be prudent and prayerful. Give us ingenuity and boldness as we explore new ways to be and to be for your people. And may those in authority decide with compassion and with respect for each quadrant of your world. And Lord, may we remember that our brothers and sisters around the world who face hunger in the wake of locusts and deprivation by despot's design. May our compasses direct us to you, O loving Savior. We pray in your holy name. Amen. And now Trip Carrington is going to read our scripture for the day. Hi there. I really hope everyone is well. Our reading today comes from the book of John, 1333 through 1414, New Revised Standard Edition. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Little children, 
I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tripp. Will you pray with me? Lord, pour through me this day the words that you would have us hear that will touch us at our point of need, and may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Amen. On this fifth Sunday of Easter, the setting of our gospel is grim and somber. Jesus has just finished a Last Supper with his disciples. He's washed their feet. He's given them a new commandment, that they should love each other. He's predicted Peter's denial. He's foretold Judas's betrayal. He's told his friends that he's about to leave them. And he says this, where I'm going, you cannot follow now. Talk about a way to buzzkill a supper. But, but tucked into the middle of this passage are some of the most memorable, even iconic verses from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house there are many rooms. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if, if in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. Now each of these could be a sermon in and of itself. And by the way, let me know if you would entertain a sermon discussion, a group we could convene on Facebook or on Zoom and wrestle together with some of the rich and complicated ways in which we read and, and hear these verses. But I want to say this morning, that questions are acceptable. Questions are welcomed. Questions are encouraged. Questions are inevitable. Now, answers may be elusive or imprecise or debatable, but questions are necessary. If not just to maintain our, our faith, but to grow towards the maturity of Christ and to live into our destiny, our purpose here together. You see, there's really nothing wrong with being uncertain or having questions or asking directions. So with that in mind, let us turn to our text today. 
Now, in these verses from John that Tripp read, there are three separate moments, three distinct times, when three persons, real human beings, three disciples even, questioned Jesus, requested clarification, asked for directions. Perhaps we can learn from them. First, let's look at Peter. Now, remember, it was Peter who climbed out of the boat to walk on the water towards Jesus and began to sink in his unbelief. And when Jesus reveals in Mark that he would be delivered to the authorities, he'd be tried and tortured and put to death, it was Peter who said, never, prompting Jesus to rebuke him and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, it was Peter who objects to Jesus washing his feet, and it was Peter who, when Jesus was arrested, assaulted Malchus, the servant of the high priest with a sword. (laughs) Yeah, Peter was impetuous. And... In our text today, he says, let me come with you now. I'll do anything. I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus, knowing what's to come, he asks him, will you? Will you lay down your life for me? And though Peter would deny Jesus, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that that Jesus knew how Peter spoke with his heart before he thought with his head. Jesus knew the weakness of Peter's resolve, but the depth of Peter's loyalty. And also Jesus knew Peter's love. He accepted that a moment's weakness did not alter that love. Now if only we could know this ourselves when colleagues, friends, and children, and sweethearts wound or hurt or disappoint us. Yes, Jesus knew Peter in his weakness. And Jesus knew Peter in all his potential. He saw in Peter whom Peter could become. He saw in Peter whom Peter would become. And men and women, Jesus sees in us whom we will be if we stay positioned for God's grace and are willing to be transformed and strengthened by God's chastening and God's challenging love. Well, next, let's look again at Thomas, loyal Thomas, who insisted to the other disciples that they accompany Jesus back to Bethany, where Jesus had barely escaped being stoned. Remember, Thomas said, let us also go that we may die with him. And also pragmatic Thomas, who interrupts, In the farewell discourse, he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? But you see, it turns out that Thomas is a man of courage and valor, a man who would ask the hard questions, who would reveal his doubts. But when met at his point of need by the risen Christ, Thomas was captured yet again. Now, don't miss the point. Christ did not judge Thomas because he had questions. He didn't say that because you're a man with a need for hard facts that you can't be my disciple. And in our text today, and when Thomas asks for directions, Jesus responds, I am the way. I am the way, Jesus says, and I'll take you there. Now, let's look at Philip. Jesus says, if you really knew me, Philip, you would know my father. And from now on, you do know him. You have seen him. And then Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and we will believe. Now, let's take a moment. Try to walk in Philip's shoes. Times are tense. The person you've left everything for speaks in riddles. You try to get a straight answer and he comes back with another illustration. What Philip is saying is, Jesus, help us out here. And then Jesus takes a different tack. He says, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. You see, Jesus is saying that he, Jesus, is God, and that the God that created all that has been created is in evidence right before them as well. And then Jesus, the rabbi, when he sees the looks on their faces, he's a teacher and he tries a different tack again. He says, Remember when John the Baptist was in prison and had his doubts and he sent his disciples to ask me, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Meaning someone who will raise an army and restore Israel to its glory. So Jesus says, go back and tell John what you hear and what you see. That the blind receive their sight, that the lame walk, that the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the good news is preached to the poor. And Jesus says the same to Philip. He says, believe me. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, if you cannot, 
then believe me because of the works themselves. So I ask you, what questions do you have this morning? Do you have doubts? Do you have fears about your job, your career, your spouse, your church, your faith, this, this pandemic? How long, dear God, how long? Do you have questions about Jesus? Well, if you do, you're in pretty good company, and so am I. It turns out that men and women who are not afraid to ask directions are essential to God's plan. But here's what's most important. Are we asking the right questions? From the beginning of our faith, the church has survived because of transformation that followed questions. 2,000 years ago, question. Could humanity be served by legalism devoid of love? Answer, no. It takes the radical, unrestricted love of the risen Christ to satisfy our innermost longings and our basic needs. Well, 1,500 years later, question. Could the church survive corruption when salvation could be bought? Answer, no. And Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg, intending to frame the discussion and instead birthing the Reformation, the reforming of Christ's church. Then, almost 200 years later, in 1936, question, could Christians pledge allegiance to a political regime, the Nazis, that denied the humanity and dignity of all people? Answer, no. The pastor, Karl Barth, wrote a declaration in the town of Barman, the Barman Declaration, that Christians confess Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. So this morning, are we asking the right questions? Too often we don't even allow questions to be asked. But here's the risk. If we don't embrace questions, that we don't allow the room for not knowing, that we don't allow room for inquiry and for mystery. Remember, a God that is within our understanding is not sufficient for our needs. A God that is within our understanding is not sufficient for our needs. The last few weeks have been a time of trial for so many people a time that raises questions. Nature, we think, unleashed a virus, an aberration that is neutral. A virus that doesn't care if you're young or old or black or white or rich or poor, from the north or the south, from Africa or Beijing. And this plague has only one purpose, to replicate. Now that breeds fear and impatience. It breeds resentment and judgment and corruption that undermines the foundations of our fragile global culture and people cry, where in the world is God? How do we face the uncertainties of life? How do we face the certainties of suffering with confidence? Well, we look to Christ and remember that he has told us, I, Christ, am the way. Now, is there someone today who is struggling with depression? or relocation and wondering where in the world is God? Is there someone here who expected better from their employer, from their family, from their church, who expected more from themselves and is questioning where God is in his or her life? Where in the world is God? It's at times like these that we must take heart and remember Christ's four simple words, men and women, I am the when we come together in pain, Jesus is beside us. When we come together to pray, Christ is with us. When we come together to help, he is our guide. Where in the world is God? Or maybe the question should be, people of second, where does God find you? Where does God find us? May God find us in the pastoral mission of this church, praying with and for someone in need who may have doubts that God is loving as well as righteous, and that God wants only the best for us, but also the best from us. So when disease attacks the fabric of our communities and, and fear assaults our faith, we Christians bind together because there Christ is. He's here. He is the way. Question. Want to know where to find Jesus? It's no secret. Come together with someone else who is a follower of Christ's for the express purpose of studying his word or worshiping his name or lifting up petitions in prayer or binding the brokenhearted and he will be there. He has promised and God can be trusted. 
You know, when the church at Corinth was giving the apostle Paul fits, he wrote in defense of his ministry. He had already, already returned to them only to be rejected and humiliated. And he writes them again saying, but we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. And for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal way to glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. So remember, lightning may strike, but we have a building from God. Terror and disease may threaten. We have a house not made with hands. We may and we will stumble and struggle, but we have an eternal home in the heavens with God. And how do we get there? When we fear that we have lost our way, we ask directions. We pray for discernment. We ask for forgiveness, and we're given God's mercy. The disciples had plenty of questions, men and women, but then they went out with purpose and in faith. And there was hope, hope that was not in vain, and hope that not through might, but through radical love, uncompromising and unconditional love, the world would be saved. Men and women of Second Church, what is at risk? Everything. If we relinquish our right to be human, then we refuse the right of anyone else to have questions. And we miss the chance to grapple with a way to describe our faith and language and with the tools of these times, such as this. These times, what these times offer and demand. You know, real men and real women do ask directions, and our gracious God is faithful. It's in the timbers and the bricks of this great old church, enabled by the lives and the witness of those giants on whose shoulders we stand, God's strength and God's delight resides. It's written on our hearts as we go in joy and purpose out into the world. I am the way. Follow me, and I'll lead you home. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we leave this place, go with the love of God and the grace of Jesus and be filled with the power of the spirit that we know is holy. May it be in you. May it be working through you every moment of your lives. Amen. Giving is so important. And there are three easy ways to do it. By mail at 342 Meeting Street. Or you can text 2nd PC to 73256. Or simply go online at 2 forward slash give.